some people they tell like okay it's okay if you did wrong god forgives and uh, they keep on telling we can like even we tell sometimes uh, it's okay even if you do wrong god is who can you know yeah god is faithful he forgives you grace, grace is there uh, your sin is not that much big god's grace is bigger than your sin we keep on telling it but it may also lead them to take it as a advantage and also it may uh, you know uh, uh, suppress that he is also a king who you know uh, punishes who does wrong so how we can balance that one so yes Uh, God is a God who is just and uh, righteous. That is his uh, moral attribute that does not change. At the same time, he's a God who is not partial. He's a God who is fair. He's also a God who is gracious and uh, compassionate. Okay. So we see in, uh, you know, God's righteousness or his justice comes alongside him fulfilling his promises, comes alongside him fulfilling of him being... Um, you know, um, loving, kind, judging the enemies or judging sin. So when God looks at sin, his nature is to immediately judge it because he's a just God, okay? His judgment comes, passes out. But then why are we not being judged? Why are we receiving grace? Because Jesus is there at the center of the throne and he's saying, God, I died on the cross for this person's sin. Please forgive them, okay? Okay. Yes, there is consequences for our sins. Whatever we do, there is consequences, right? So, for example, um, you didn't uh, study for your test. The consequences, you fail. You didn't stop at the signal light when it was red. You just went. You can land up in an accident. If you're over speeding, you can, uh, you know, yeah. And if you don't eat right food, you can also, you know, it has consequences so everything has consequences but we see that you know god is just but at the same time he is compassionate and gracious merciful and forgiving when we go to him and ask him for forgiveness yes he forgives us but we do face the consequences for our sins but he also can you know use that to strengthen us and build us So now, is it like even uh, as we have been redeemed and uh, Jesus is the center mm. of between us and God? Mm. So one who is interceding on behalf of us. Yeah. So it's like when we sin, uh, God don't sees our sins, but God sees the price that was paid. No, God sees our sin. The judgment passes out, but what comes out is grace and mercy. So it's all the time the same. It's not, I'm saying we have the grace and mercy. We don't receive the wrath of God, but we face the consequences for our sins. We do face the consequences for our sins. Consequences in the sense? Consequences means in you, you don't eat, you're going to, you know, you're going to collapse. You don't study. The wages of sin is only death. The consequence for sin, sin is, is death. death. Yes, for the, that's why I'm saying. So when God is a just God, but then when you don't ask for forgiveness for your sins, you, yeah, you face it. Even for people who are the sin? No, when we are when we are born again, you know, we are ushered into the kingdom of God. Uh, our, uh, you know, we are uh, salvation is eternal. But Hebrews chapter six and Hebrews chapter uh, ten also says that you know, if we uh, having known the truth, you know, and we treat the blood of the covenant as an unholy thing, then there is no more forgiveness of sins left, but only a fearful uh, punishment. Okay, so we don't know which is that sin, what is that sin, where it is not. You know, uh, if you look at um, Hebrews, uh, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 26 and 27, and also Hebrews chapter 6, uh, verses 4 to 6. Okay, so Hebrews chapter 6, verses 4 to 6, and Hebrews chapter 10, it says, uh, Hebrews chapter 10, 26 and 27 says, even when we sin willfully after we have received the knowledge of the truth, 
there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins. Okay? But a fearful expectation of judgment and fury indignation which will devour the adversaries. Okay? So we don't know which is that limit of sin that we reach to where it falls into this category. It's not given here. But yes, there can be a chance where we can lose it. Hebrews chapter 6 and Hebrews chapter 10. Okay? So suppose we are coming to sin in faith. In faith, I've known God, but I commit the sin over and over again. I know after a certain point of time, like when you lose that sense of you know the right and wrong of that sin, is that when you know that uh, the grace of God left you because you kept going back, coming in, going back, coming in, mm -hmm. and then that sense of right, right and wrong, the line is blurred. Is that when you know that your uh, conscience becomes dead to that sin? Yeah. Yes. So is that when you know that you have uh, come uh, like God has left you, you come far from that far from it, you cross the line that much? Yeah, you've crossed the line way before. Yeah. Okay. Huh. No. And so you're saying is this what's the category that's mentioned in chapter six and chapter ten of Hebrews? Is that your uh, question? You know, is that the limit? I'm, yeah, is that the limit I'm asking? That's what I'm saying. I, it's not explained to me, and I don't know what the limit is. I don't okay. know what is that limit, what is that sin. But it says, if you keep on willfully sinning after you have come to the knowledge of the truth, then. So we don't know which willfully sinning, which sin, what sin, what is the extent. But we always know that God is gracious and merciful. He's waiting to, you know, forgive us. If we really don't know what is that limit. Even if they want to, uh, you know, uh, walk, mic, please. even if they want to uh, walk uh, righteously before the Lord, but because of they don't have a good fellowship or good mentoring, uh, like they will be uh, poor or weak in their strength. They will be like sliding back sometimes, like the Israelites, how uh, God restored and then still they go back to idol worship. So uh, it's like willfully. Yes, that's willful. Yes. So uh, how how we can you know uh, treat them or how we can look at this uh, situation? Romans chapter one says nobody has any excuse because God, creation itself reveals the the Godhead, it reveals the glory, the power, and uh, the Godhead. So no one is without excuse that you know we didn't know God, we didn't know the Son. Creation itself reveals. The power of God. So we, uh, even if you don't have fellowship, you have the word of God. You have to get into fellowship. You have to do something. You can't be oscillating, going in and out. Yes. When they're talking about these consequences and all, mm. like the people who got redeemed, who are redeemed and all, they are heirs of uh, kingdom that we know. Like uh, when we are talking about the consequences of this, uh, I mean, born again people, if they sin and all, the consequences are or uh, or will become physically here on the earth or after the death no everything the consequences we pay here we we go through the consequences of our sin here Throughout yes in in our daily life yes we experience it here we can't go to heaven and ex you know the sun the consequences of our sin right so, ma'am uh, as an example to understand for us, uh, so it's the consequence is like if we lied to uh, some person. Uh, God won't uh, see our sin, but we'll face the consequences. No, God, we can't say God does not like, see our sin. He, he sees he our sins. He sees sins, but uh, because we are redeemed, we ask for forgiveness. God uh, forgives us. His forgiveness, but we will uh, face the consequence of the lie that we have uh, spoken. Yes. That's how. Otherwise, we, we can keep on. How do we learn? Right. Okay, last, because we have to move on. Okay. Yes. Uh, no, the last thing I want to mention is in Revelation, it says in the third chapter that if you are not, if you're neither not, uh, neither hot nor cold, you know, God. You out of my mouth. Yeah. So, but, lukewarm. Uh, yeah, lukewarm. If you're lukewarm. So, like, this this can be like uh, applied to sin. If you're committing the sin and coming back to God, you're going here and you're not staying anyone. 
you're going uh, you can either you're not staying hot not cold you're going back and forth so it says god himself will spit you out if you're like that you're unsure of what you're doing you're not unsure of what you want to do this or that yeah so what what is your question yeah yeah back and forth if you go then yes that is actually sinning willfully you know the truth and you're going back and forth right yeah yes so like even uh, i mean uh, even god, i mean if you see that it is god who spew you out of the mouth your mouth yeah so even, that is in a in a specific context for a specific church that he's writing to right one of the seven churches at uh, uh, near ephesus i think it's laodicea i don't know if it's the, the right church yeah. huh laodicea yeah laodicea yeah. so he he says he spew you out of the mouth so he they already know but you know they're going back and forth it does not mean that god does not when they it does not mean when they ask for forgiveness god is not going to be gracious and merciful it's not that god has totally rejected them see god does not totally reject anybody but he just... always gives them a chance to come back even in the last moment they have the opportunity for salvation so essentially if they are going in that way god uh, i mean so god still loves them but yes. they are themselves are going in that yes. direction so it is their thing yes okay god still loves them irrespective god does not like our sin but he likes a sinner right yeah yes and oh. he's always waiting for a sinner to repent and come back it's god's good pleasing and perfect will that all men be saved and come to the knowledge of his salvation timothy okay, okay? he write all writing okay. to timothy okay so we'll move on um so we're looking at how jesus came into this world and how he's introducing the kingdom of god and what he uh, did okay and i think it's important for us to understand that because you know uh, um uh, because we and you know when we believe when we take the same approach that jesus took we will also be able to see the establishment of the spiritual kingdom of god okay we're not talking about the natural kingdom the natural kingdom will come when jesus himself will come and establish it thousand year millennium rule but here we're talking more about the spiritual kingdom so you and i are responsible for the extension of the spiritual kingdom even as we adapt the same method that jesus took to introduce his kingdom and also it is our responsibility to see the furtherance of the kingdom of god okay now who had the privilege of being the forerunner of jesus john the baptist okay he was the one who came heralding the kingdom of god he was the one who came um speaking about the kingdom and he was the one who came to introduce the king and the kingdom okay look at what matthew chapter 3 verse 2 uh, says okay matthew chapter 3 verse 2 says okay Uh, it says repent for the kingdom of god is at hand okay repent for the kingdom of god is at um at the hand uh, so we see that you know um john the baptist had a unique privilege of all the old testament prophets to be the immediate forerunner of jesus christ okay and look at what he's um, uh, what jesus said in the light of this in in john chapter luke chapter 7 verse 28 luke chapter 7 verse 28 can somebody read that please for i say to you among those born of women there is not a greater prophet than john the baptist but he who is least in the kingdom of god is greater than he yeah so we see that um you know um he says that of all those born of women this is the greatest prophet because he had the unique opportunity and privilege of saying hey the king is coming and this is the king or this is the messiah that we were looking for and yet jesus went on to say this about john the baptist that whoever is least in the kingdom of god is greater than john Okay, John had the unique privilege of all the Old Testament prophets. Uh, prophets, he was the only one who could say, "Hey, this is the King is coming, and this is the King." But Jesus went on to say that of all the people in the kingdom, the least in the kingdom of God is greater than John the Baptist. Okay, so we see that John the Baptist could introduce the King, but he could not enter the kingdom of God because he was not 
born again because Jesus had not yet died on the cross and he had not yet resurrected. Okay, the resurrection had not yet taken place, but so he was still not part of the kingdom of God. But you and I seated here have this unique privilege of being born again and who have not only the unique privilege of being part of this kingdom and uh, having God as our king, but we also can say, hey, the king is coming back and the king is here. Where is the king? Inside me. Okay. His rule and reign is in and through me. So this is a rare privilege. It's a wonderful privilege. And uh, Jesus says that the least in the kingdom of God is greater than the greatest of the Old Testament prophets. And who is that? John the Baptist. Okay. Now we see that Jesus takes a threefold approach in introducing the kingdom of God here on earth. So what is a threefold approach? Uh, we read this in Matthew chapter 4 verses 17 and 23 and Matthew chapter 9 verse uh, 35. So can somebody please read these two passages, please? Matthew 4, verse 17, 23. From that time, Jesus began to preach and to say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And Jesus went about all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing all kinds of sickness and all kinds of disease among the people. Yeah, so when... Uh when he went, when Jesus went, he went about doing what? Introducing the kingdom. And he did three things. What are the three things he did? Preaching the good news of the kingdom. Second one, teaching the, the kingdom. And third one is healing or demonstrating the power of the kingdom. And we see the same thing repeated in Matthew chapter 9 verse uh, 35. Okay. Where in Matthew chapter 9 verse 35 it says that once again Jesus went into all the cities and villages teaching in the synagogues preaching the gospel of the kingdom healing every sickness and every disease that was among the people. So there are, to sum it up, there are three things that Jesus did. He preached the good news. He taught about the kingdom and he demonstrated the power of the kingdom. And that is how we need to introduce the kingdom of God in our world today. Okay. So now if you had to herald the good news of the earthly kingdom, what would you have done? If you have to herald the good news of the kingdom of God here on earth, what would you have done? What would you have done? You would go and tell people what? The good news. Hey, the king is here, he's a king who's conquered his enemies. He's a king who brings peace. He's a king who brings shalom to everybody who comes into his kingdom. And in his kingdom, he is wonderful. He's a great advisor. He is so powerful. He's a mighty God. He's our father. And you know, he's also the prince of peace. So would you like to come into this kingdom? Basically, as simple as that. Okay. So you will tell people about this kingdom. Uh, how this kingdom was, has overthrown all other king, uh, kingdoms. And you will tell them how the king of this kingdom is so wonderful, so powerful. And you tell them how they need to be part of this kingdom. Okay. So you and I have this privilege or this responsibility uh, to advance the kingdom of God to do the same thing that Jesus did. To preach, to teach, and also to demonstrate the kingdom of God. Okay. So, um, we look at uh, how Jesus introduced his kingdom uh, throughout this, you know, this book. We look at what he taught about the kingdom, about his teachings, and all of his teachings that he taught was, you know, transformed the thinking of people's minds and also transformed the way of their living. Okay. So, just in this chapter, we look at a few things that Jesus taught about the kingdom of God, but we will study throughout this book, you know, the various teachings, the various parables that Jesus taught and how he introduced the kingdom of um, God. But we'll just look at a few of them now, okay? The first thing is uh, Matthew chapter 5, verse 3. Okay, so can somebody read that, please? Matthew chapter 5, verse 3. And we're looking at uh, how Jesus... 
uh, thought about this kingdom and whatever he thought about this kingdom transformed the minds and the lives of people and these are some of the things he said matthew chapter 5 verse 3 blessed are the poor in spirit for theirs is the kingdom of heaven yes so what it means to be poor here blessed are those who are poor in spirit for theirs is the kingdom of heaven what does it mean to be poor have nothing do poor people have nothing weak needy yes uh, uh, to be poor is in a state of always why are you looking at her like that <laughs> to be poor is in a state of being always in need to want to beg or to ask for more okay to be poor in spirit is to be needy in the spirit which means to be hungry for more there is an unquenchable thirst there is a continuous state of wanting of hunger of begging of crying out for god for more in your spirit man you're always needy in your spirit man and actually it's a good thing to be in that state of being you know having that unquenchable thirst wanting begging crying out for more of god it's a good thing why is it a good thing look at what the verse says you're blessed okay so if you are in this continuous thing of being needy you are blessed and you are the one who's going to experience his kingdom okay and the blessings are yours and yours is the kingdom okay so you are the woman you are the man who's going to experience this kingdom and you are the woman you are the man who's going to experience his blessing okay look at what has jesus thought about the kingdom in matthew chapter 5 verse 10 anina john says to be uh, poor in spirit is to be dependent yes thank you nina uh, look at what matthew chapter 5 verse 10 says somebody can read that please blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake for theirs is the kingdom of heaven so when you are being persecuted or wrongly judged or mistreated for doing what is right, just remember the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The kingdom of heaven is yours. Okay. And the glory of God shall be revealed in you and in through you. Okay. Both in this life and in the life to come. Because the kingdom of God, you know, outweighs all our problems are momentary problems difficulties challenges that we face okay and jesus goes on teaching the people more about the kingdom when he said that hey if you want to be a big shot in the kingdom of god you know if we want to be someone great or a big shot in the kingdom of god i will tell you how to do it okay so how does he tell us to be a big shot in the kingdom of god matthew chapter 5 verse 19 can somebody read that, please? Whoever therefore breaks or not the least of these commandments and teaches men so shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does and teaches them, he shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Yeah. Amen. So Jesus says, if you'll do the word and teach others how to do the word, you will be a big shot in the kingdom of heaven or you will be great in the kingdom of heaven heaven okay so this is the kingdom of god it's not about what possessions you have it's not about what position you hold but if you would just do what god wants you to do and teach others to do the same thing it will give you a good place it will give you a good standing it will give you a good position okay now there are a few occasions when jesus described uh, what leads to greatness in the kingdom in other places, what does Jesus say? Who can be great in the kingdom of God? Yeah, he brings a child and says, whoever is childlike or humble, you humble yourself like a, ch a child in, the relation in your relationship with your father, that will make you great in the kingdom of heaven. Matthew chapter 18, verse 4. Okay. He also said, what else did he say about humbling ourselves? Yes, servant attitude, okay? 
if you humble yourself to become a servant to others, that will bring you to a place of greatness in the kingdom of God. Okay, Matthew chapter 20 verse 26. But here in Matthew chapter 5 verse 19, Jesus instructs us that if we do his word and personally live lives by doing it and following it and then teaching others how to live by the word, it leads us to a place of honor in his kingdom. Okay, so two things. We need to do God's word and we have to do it, live it, and then teach it to others. So first we live it out of our own lives and then we share with others how to live it and then, you know, help them to live out the word of God in their own lives as well. Okay, so Jesus went on to say, uh, in Matthew chapter 5, verse 20, he says, hey, listen, you know, um, there are, he looks at the Pharisees and says, these are the kind of people you shouldn't be like. Okay, he looks at the Pharisees, Matthew chapter 5, verse 20, you know, continuing with this passage, we read Matthew chapter 5, verse 19, Matthew chapter 5, verse 20, he says, he said, unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the Pharisees and scribes, you will by no means enter the kingdom of God. Okay. So he looks at them and says, hey, these are the kind of people you shouldn't be like. Okay. Then he teaches more about the kingdom of God. Um, you know, look at what he says in Matthew chapter 6, verse 10 to 13. Okay. He says, you know, he talks about prayer. Look, when you pray, pray about the kingdom. And what should you pray and say when you pray? Okay. Matthew chapter 6, verse 10 and 13. Can one of you please read that? Matthew 6, 10 to 13, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Yes. So Jesus says, hey, when you finish praying, what do you do? Look at those verses. When you finish praying, what do you do? <laughs> say Amen. <laughs> Okay, before you say amen, what do you do? You're praying. This is part of the prayer. Huh? Yours is the kingdom. Acknowledge the king. And say thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever. So we are saying, God, I acknowledge you as sovereign king, as Lord, as the omnipotent one, as the, uh, as the omnipotent one over the universe. The ruler who nobody can question or challenge. Okay. So that is what he is saying in Matthew chapter 6, verse 10 and um, 13. Okay. And then look at what he also goes on to teach in Matthew chapter 6, verse 33. Can somebody read that, please? But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. Yes. Then he goes on to say, Hey, you know about your priorities. Here's what your priorities should be. What should your priority be? Seek the kingdom of God first and his righteousness. What happens when you seek God's kingdom first and his righteousness? Everything will be added. So let the kingdom of God begin to affect or, you know, affect your priorities. What you think is important in life so you need to seek god's kingdom first and then what will happen whatever you have to eat drink what where you have what you have to sleep on you know your career everything is taken care of by god okay huh? <laughs> what do you want to yes why not god doesn't want you all to live in poverty right he wants his children to have the best, drive the best car, live in the best house. And uh, he, yes, he provides us, provides our needs, not our greed. But then this is, <laughs> you know, but um, there's nothing wrong in living in a big house. Nothing wrong in driving a car. You work hard, you buy one, you work hard, you build a house, you live in it, enjoy yourself. But then... Um, Yes, what is the whole aspect of the kingdom of God? The principle is what? It's not money is not evil. The love for money is the root of all 
evil. Okay, that's what Paul writes to Timothy. Uh, but you know, um, how do we use God blesses us with money, He wants us to be rich, but it's not just for us to satisfy our more and more and more and more and more, but it's also to give into His kingdom to ex for the expansion of His kingdom. So, if you have a two story house, you want to build a five story, six story house when only two or three of you are living in as a family, it's, it's not necessary. You can use that to build and extend God's kingdom, give into God's kingdom, okay? Nothing wrong in, in desiring great things or big things for yourself. God is not against that, yeah. Okay, the next thing what he teaches us about the kingdom of God is doing the will of the Father. Matthew chapter 7, verse 21. Can somebody read that, please? Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Yeah, so here Jesus is emphasizing that doing the will of the Father is more important than just lip service, just talking, just preaching, this teaching, just worshiping God, more than lip service, okay? So it is about he, knowing Him personally and, um, you know, more than you know, just doing the dynamics or the mechanics or, uh, you know, the so-called Christian jargons or the style and everything of using his name while ministering his name or teaching his name. But it's about how intimately and personally you know him and you're ministering out of that place of intimacy, out of that place of personal experience and power from uh, God. Okay. So like this, Jesus talked about the kingdom, uh, teaching, and challenging people's thinking, their thinking, their minds, their way of living. And this is how we introduce the kingdom. Okay. We also see that Jesus demonstrated the kingdom. We we read earlier in the scriptures in Matthew chapter 4 and verse and, and Matthew chapter 9 that he went about healing people, casting out devils, delivering people, and saying, This is the kingdom okay look at what he says in matthew chapter 12 verse 28 can somebody read that please matthew chapter 12 verse 28 but if i cast out demons by the spirit of god Surely the kingdom of God has come upon you. Okay, I think Nina John is trying to speak, but we can't hear her, uh, Anand. Oh, okay, okay, then it's fine. <laughs> uh, sorry, Nina, we can't hear you. Just a minute. Uh, no, they have no, some speaker here and... What happened? Yeah, it does not support. Nothing is supporting my new laptop. It doesn't support Skype, doesn't support Zoom. Uh, just a minute, Nina. They're just connecting uh, it to another laptop so we can hear you speak. Can you speak, uh, Nina? Nina? But if I cast out demons, can you hear me? Just a minute, no. just a minute, please. Let's go ahead. But if I cast out demons, you can hear me? It's okay. Just a minute, Nina. They're trying to... Okay, uh, maybe what we'll do is till they figure that out, we'll just continue with our lesson and then we can ask you your question or what you have to say. Is that okay, Nina? Yeah. Okay, so uh, we see here. Oh, she wanted to read the scripture, I think. Okay, fine. So Jesus says in Matthew chapter 12, verse 28, that if I cast out demons by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. Okay? So it says, if I cast out devils by the Spirit, then this is a sign that the kingdom of God is here. 
So this is this is me ushering the kingdom of God. And so he's saying by casting out devils and healing the sick is what Jesus said is how he is demonstrating the power of the kingdom. Or this is how he's inaugurating the kingdom into this world. And he's uh, also taught his disciples to do the same thing. Okay. And then he says in Matthew chapter 10, verse 7 and 8. So Nina, John, you can read Matthew chapter 10, verse 7 and 8. And as you go, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. And as you go, preach saying, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out demons. Freely you have received, freely give. Thank you, Nina, John. It's a, it's a joy to hear a voice of an online student. Thank you. Um, so here we see that, you know, um, uh, we have freely received and we can freely give. So don't, you know, uh, hold back and say, hey, if I pray, is, people are going to be healed, cleansed, the dead is going to be raised. You, you freely receive, freely give. Okay. So looking at all of these passages, uh, here's a challenge that I like to put forward uh, to all of us, that you and I are responsible to see the kingdom of God, you know, extended here on earth. Jesus has, uh, you know, uh, inaugurated the kingdom again after it was, you know, uh, it was given off to Satan. Uh, the authority was given. He took back the keys of authority. He came and inaugurated the kingdom of God. He has uh, extended the kingdom of God to us. He has extended the invitation. You and I have, uh, you know, chosen that invitation. You have accepted that invitation. And now it's... Uh, your, your responsibility and my responsibility uh, to extend his kingdom here on um, earth, okay? Um, so as we do that, you know, even as we, um, you know, um, do this responsibility, what are the things that we need to do? We need to announce the good news, preach the good news of the kingdom, and also, you know, some of us don't like the word preach. You know, you, you'll say, I'm not called to preach. So we can use other words. Just tell others. Or just share share to us, share with others. Or just speak, you know, speak the word of God to others. Whatever. You know, just tell people to share about the king and the kingdom. Okay? So share, teach, speak, tell whatever about the king and the kingdom. Okay? Uh, and also demonstrate the kingdom of God. So this is a method Jesus used. And it's the same method that you and I are asked to do uh, or to use even as we uh, desire or God desires to advance his kingdom in our world today. Okay. So that is uh, chapter 2 for us. Anyone has any questions? Online students? If you have any questions, please unmute your mics and ask. Vimal joined. Okay. After so many days, Vimal has joined. Okay. Okay, any questions anyone has online students in person? Okay, if there's no questions, then we'll have just have 10 more minutes. So maybe just eight more minutes so we can start chapter two. Okay, let's start chapter three, sorry. Okay, thank you, Ravali. Uh, so what part does the church have in the kingdom of God? What is the relationship between the church and the kingdom? Okay, that is what we're going to look at in chapter three. Now we must understand that the church is part of the overall kingdom of God. And at this present time, okay, the church is the representative or the church represents the kingdom of God here on earth. Okay, so when we talk about church, what are we basically talking about? People, okay, we're talking about us, you and me. We're not talking about a building or a structure, okay. And the Lord Jesus has vested his authority 
of the kingdom is given it to whom? The church. He's given it to us. Okay. Look at Matthew chapter 16, verses 18 and 19. Can one of the online students please unmute and read? Matthew chapter 16, verses 18 and 19. Anyone? Kira, you like to read Matthew chapter 16, verses 18 and 19? Or anyone else? Yes, ma'am. Can you hear me, ma'am? Yes, we can. But, but those things which proceed out of the mouth come from the heart and the divine the heart. No, can you please read? Well. Uh, sorry, Chira. Matthew chapter 16, verses 18 and 19. Matthew 16, 18 and 19. Okay, okay, okay. And I also said to you that you are Peter, and to this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth, will be bound in heaven and whatever you lose on earth will be lost in heaven amen. amen thank you chiram nice to hear your voice so peter has just proclaimed that jesus is the christ the son of the living god and what does jesus tell him jesus says peter on this truth that christ is the son of the living god i'm going to establish my church and he says that this church is a church will overthrow the powers of hell and he says and i will give to the church the keys of the kingdom of heaven okay so jesus said that he would build his church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it or the gates of hell will not overpower the church now in the old testament times the city gates Okay, for every city had an entrance, had the gates. It was a place of, uh, you know, importance. It was a place of protection and control. Why protection? Yes, who, uh, you have access to enter or you don't have access to enter. Okay, it was also a place, uh, you, you know, of control. Why? Yeah, we can control who comes in and who goes out. It was the gates of the city was all had also represented uh, represented the you know um, um, uh, the seat of power. Okay, that is where you know the the uh, you know the so called elders of the uh, city would sit. And, you know, they would pass their judgments or people would come and, you know, they would discuss things about the city and all of those uh, things. Okay. So here it says that, you know, uh, so these gates represent power, control and protection. Okay. So the gates of hell basically represents the powers of hell or the control of hell. So the powers of hell cannot stop the church. Okay. So, and it also here means that gates are stationary. Does gates move? No, the gates don't move. So, gates don't move. So, it is a church that must advance against the gates of hell. Okay. So, it says, you know, um, I will build my church and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. Okay. So, the church must advance towards the gates of hell. So the church will not just sit around waiting for the the power or the control of the hell to come to us. But in essence, it says the church that is Jesus, you know, has to confront and overpower or overthrow the powers of hell. So to this, Jesus says, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Now, what does keys represent? It represents authority. Yes, so Jesus said he has given us the keys of hell and death. We read this in Revelation chapter 1 verse 18, which means that Jesus has conquered death. 
He's conquered Satan. He's conquered sin. He has overpowered them. Then they're nullified. They are rendered powerless, inoperative, have no power absolutely. And Jesus has conquered and overpowered hell and death. And Jesus has given whom the authority now? Who he does? He shares his authority uh, or the victory does he has won. He has shared it with you and I. So the church has the authority of the kingdom of heaven to do what? What does it say here? Matthew chapter 16, verses 18 and 19. You know, the church is given authority of the kingdom of heaven to do what? To bind and to lose. Yes, we are... Uh, you know, we advance against the enemy from a point of victory because he's already, you know, defeated. Uh, he is rendered powerless. Okay. Uh, he has no, he's stripped of all his powers. Okay. But the church's authority of the kingdom of heaven to do what? To bind on earth what is bound in heaven and to lose on earth what is loosed in heaven. Okay. So what does that mean? Mike, please. We. Uh, what does it mean to bind? Uh, uh, Nina speaking. Can you? Can you hear me? Yes. 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 Okay. So we are binding uh, is prohibiting the works of darkness to operate on the earth, and uh, releasing the powers. I mean, because since he has given us the authority to release uh, what is contrary to the kingdom of darkness, I mean, to release what is operating in the kingdom of God release that over the earth. I mean, or over any situation or whatever is happening. So, because He has given us the authority to bind those powers of darkness and to release uh, the powers of the kingdom on the earth in yes. any situation. Is that it? I don't know. Y yes. 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 Thank you, Nina. So, we basically uh, release here on earth what is in heaven. Okay, in heaven there is no sickness, there's no pain, there's no uh, death, there is no suicide, there is no jealousy, hatred, uh, lust of the eyes, lust of the flesh, pride of life. So whatever is not there, you know, the works of the enemy, the power of the enemy, the schemes of the enemy, we nullify it, you know, here. And whatever is in heaven, we release it basically here. And just like what Nina John also said. Okay, uh, we'll stop here. We just have one minute. Anyone has any questions? Any questions? While we, uh, I mean, just the, the previous words. Speaking so you can, yeah. Yes, go ahead, Nina. Yeah, I said while we do that, just the previous chapter where, uh, where it says about the, you know, what we need to do. The kingdom of heaven is at hand, heal the sick, cleanse the lips. And also here that we have the power to, uh, you know, I mean, the authority to bind and lose. While we are in the midst of that, I mean, we do get uh, requests and things like that, and we are doing, but then there are times uh, when it is challenging too. Like, you know, sometimes it is like people related to, the, uh, for some reason, about three people are there whom we are praying for, you know, brain related issues. So, I mean, while there is kind of improvement and they're getting better, but it's still kind of challenging. It's not as if it just happens like that. No, you know what I'm saying? So the, yes. in those uh, times then, okay, so what do we do? I mean, we, of course we will press in and press on, uh, but is there anything else that we can do or we need to step up the prayer even more or what is it? So that it's really yes, that's a good good question as a challenge that we all face um, uh, most often. So what we can do is just go back 
to our closets, go back to, to God and say, God, what did, what did I not do right? Or what should I do? What is the breakthrough for this person? Uh, because, you know, he the sickness is uh, manifesting. It can be because of various underlining issues, emotions, unforgiveness, uh, some sin, uh, something of the past, you know, something. So we can ask God to show us where we get down to the roots and, you know, um, uh, you know, uh, and and then and pray accordingly, uh, but we don't have all the answers, and we don't know why sometimes there is no healing. But we don't, uh, you know, we just press on still, like you said, because it's God's nature to heal, and it's He's not the author of sickness and disease, and we know it's not from Him, and so we just still press on, and we we pray and we ask, and we ask God to help us uh, to see how we can go forward. Okay, we'll stop here because we're two minutes past the time, and. Um, we we'll have to go to our next class. I have another next uh, class after this. Uh, thank you all for joining class, and I'll see you next week. Have a blessed week, and happy Independence Day to all of you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> yeah.